everybody. I recently received some really great questions about Keeper from, from some students, and I thought rather than write them, I would try to answer them here. So I'm just going to go down the line, and um, from the questions that I've received, I've, I've printed them out, so here we go. Uh, the first few are from Sarah Johnson, who lives in Germany. So this is an international question answering episode. So here we go. One of the questions that Sarah asked is, have you eaten Blue Moon Gumbo and what does it taste like? Well, I've eaten gumbo. I can't say that I've specifically eaten Blue Moon Gumbo because so far as I know, I've never eaten gumbo on, on a Blue Moon, but maybe I have, I just wasn't paying attention. Um, as far as what it tastes like, it seems to me like each batch of gumbo tastes a little different. And that's because most gumbo chefs have their own unique ingredients that they put in the gumbo. Um, some gumbo is very spicy. Some has crab. Some doesn't. My, my particular favorite kind of gumbo has chicken and sausage in it. So, um, and it tastes like soup, basically, with chicken and sausage. And, of course, the secret ingredient is filet. And that is made from sassafras root. So... There you go. Also, Sarah asked, why are there crabs in this story? Well, I think crabs have basically been shortchanged in literature. I mean, there just aren't that many stories with crabs in them, especially crabs that um, seem to know what they want. So um, I thought it would be fun to have crabs in the story. And when I was a little girl, my grandmother used to take me out to this pier that was um, out in the bay from Texas City, along the coast of Texas, and we would take string, just plain old cotton string, and usually some chicken necks or something like that, and we would lower the string down into the water, and we had to hold on to it, and you had to, you know, feel, wait to feel the tug on the top of your finger and when you felt a little tug that meant that there was something that was biting on the um, chicken and so you had to you had to like slowly slowly oh so slowly pull it up because if you pull too fast whatever was there would jump off and so if you were lucky, as the, as the string got towards the surface of the water, you would see a crab. And that was when um, my grandmother would come over and, and, and I'd hold on to the string and she would dip the crab, you know, dip a net underneath the crab and catch it. And so that is how we caught crabs. So that was a fun episode from my life and I wanted to include it in the story. And so that's why there are crabs. Okay, Sarah also asked, how does Keeper understand the animals? Well, I'm not so sure that she totally understands them, but I think any of those of us who have lived with animals, with pets, and, um, and have observed animals, um, I think it's a natural thing for us to believe that we understand them. And um, Keeper believes, of course, that she has mermaid blood in her veins and so that would give her special powers to understand the animals especially um, especially sea animals which the crabs are so the next question comes from a student named Riley who is from Snow Horse Elementary in Utah and um, Riley Riley has a really great question he asks why did Keeper see a fish's tail when her mom swam away if her mom was not a mermaid? Well, first of all, maybe her mom is a mermaid. Maybe. Could be. It's possible. But the other thing is, if you were out in the sea and you turned around and saw a fish's tail, that wouldn't be unlikely, first of all. You know, there's lots of fishes in the sea, to, to use an old cliche. But um, if, if, if Keeper's mother had just swam away from her, 
And she turned around and looked out at the sea and saw a fish's tail in the, in the moonlight. Why wouldn't she think it was her mother's? So there, there's the answer to that, maybe. And Taylor, who is also from Snow, Snow Horse Elementary, asked this question. Will there be more books like this? Hmm. Well, I'm not planning to write another mermaid book, but hopefully there will be more books. I'm not sure if they'll be like this, but hopefully there will be more books. Okay, now, I know I said this was from students, these questions, but um, Danae Lu, who is a librarian at Snow Horse Elementary, asked me a really great question, so I thought I would answer that, or try to. She asked, um, I would like to know if any special preparation is needed to channel so many different critters through your pen. For instance, and I love this, do you need to hang out at picnics and steal french fries from children before you write as a seagull? <laughs> well, I've never stolen french fries from children, <laughs> although I love french fries, I truly do. Um, one thing I do love, though, above all else, is watermelon. It is definitely my favorite food, so it was easy for me to have watermelon be Captain's favorite food. But what, I'm glad she asked the question because um, Captain is based on a real seagull. When, when I was um, growing up, my grandmother lived in Galveston, and one night a storm blew in, and with it came a seagull that crashed into her kitchen window. And um, she nursed the seagull back to health. It had badly damaged its wing. And, um, and at the same time, my grandmother had a dog named BD. And um, the two of them, the dog and the seagull, actually became very good friends. And while the seagull's wing was mending, it would actually perch itself on the dog's back and, and take a ride. <laughs> and... Um, and, I, and it, the seagull became so tame, actually, that it would ride in the car with my grandmother and her dog. And, and my grandmother drove a green Dodge station wagon, just like the car that Signe drives in Keeper. So, um, so that doesn't answer the total question about preparing to write for, uh, from the viewpoint of different animals. And all I can say is that I, I just really pay attention. You know, I... I observe animals as much as I can. I read an awful lot about them. I, I do a lot, a lot of research. And so um, so I, I really spent a lot of time looking up seagulls and, and reading about them. But more than anything else, I remembered that seagull from my childhood. And, um, and um, anyway, and I'm not planning to steal french fries from children. <laughs> But I might steal some watermelon. <laughs> okay. So um, so now I've got a few questions from some students at the New Canaan Country Day School in New Canaan, Connecticut. So I want to I want to quickly go through those. Um, one of the students from New Canaan asked an important question about this book. They asked, why is there a gay couple? presented them in this book? And the answer is really simple. My boys, I have two, two boys who, that are grown now, but when they were younger, they had a, a gay relative. Well, in fact, they still do have a gay relative. But that member, that family member, never showed up in their books when they were in junior high or middle school. Um, it was as if that family member, who was so important to them, was invisible or worse, non-existent. And so by putting Jacques Demer and Henri Beecham in my story, I was attempting to honor that gay relative, but also to honor all those kids who have gay members in their families and who never see them in the pages of their books. And so um, I tried to present my gay couple in a very loving and very matter-of-fact way, which is exactly the way our gay family member is, very loving and very matter-of-fact. It's really as simple as that. Um, 
Also from New Canaan, this question comes, why did you make Sinbad have just one good eye instead of two? And the simple answer to that question is that uh, whenever I think of the quintessential pirate, and I think of Sinbad as a pirate cat, I think of a, a character with, you know, a patch over his eye, one eye. And so, um, so that, that was why I gave Sinbad just one good eye, because I envisioned him as coming from pirates, pirate cats. Um, the same person that asked me about the, the um, eye said, um, said, I wonder if there were two cats because Sinbad's spots change and so does his bad eye. And then they say, that's weird. Yep. It's a little weird, but you know, uh, one of the great things about being an author is you get to make stuff up, and um, sometimes the weirder the better, right? <laughs> so there you go. Um, all right, so another student from New Canaan asked, why did you make the bowl so important? Well, um, the bowl was all that Signe had left from her mother, and so that right there gave it significance. But I also had an important bowl um, when I was growing up. My grandmother, my, a different grandmother from the one with the seagull, had a big wooden bowl. And when we were small, we were, my sisters and I would climb into the bowl, and my grandmother would spin us around and around on the floor. And she sang a little spinning song to us. And it was such a sweet thing, and, and I remembered it. And, and I wish I had that bowl. I've missed that bowl. And sometimes when I'm writing, I write to whatever is missing in my life in an attempt to recapture it. And so, and I, and I tell my students the same thing, you know, write towards the hole in your heart. Because our hearts always, there's, there's always something that we're missing. Whether it's an object or a person or a pet or something. Um, so I, I try to write to, to what is missing, to the hole in my heart. And um, I, I lost my grandmother. My, she was 98 when she died, so she lived a very long life. But, um, but I, I think about her often, and whenever I do, I think about that wooden bowl. So in a way, giving Signe that wooden bowl was also giving myself the bowl back, if that makes sense. And then final question, why did you put so much hope in this story? And um, this is actually the easiest question because I think hope is actually what we live on. I think it's what gets us up in the morning, our hope for a nice day, our hope for a, a happy day. And I think it's um, what puts us to bed at night, our hope for happy, for happy dreams, for sweet dreams. And so, um, so there you go. I want to thank the students from Germany, from New Canaan, Connecticut, and from Snow Horse Elementary in Utah. And if anybody else has questions, please just send them to me and um, and I'll give them I'll give the answers a shot. Okay, signing off.